Hello, Professor Sargent here with you again for our flipped classroom lesson on section 2.5, Relations and Functions. Give you a moment to read through that, and then I'm going to give some examples to try to clarify. So notice that a relation can be expressed in a number of ways. We may or may not have numbers for our first and second part, i.e. component or coordinates. When we do, we often, as we've already been doing, refer to those in the ordered pairs x comma y. The domain is the set of all x's being used by the relation. The range is all set of y's being used in the relation. And a function is a special relation where each x in the domain is paired with exactly one y in the range. Suppose it's the year 2004, and I'm an aspiring amateur musician, but also an aspiring uh, computer person looking to set up social media before most people know about it. And I'm trying to get musicians to connect with each other. So I contacted representatives of Bon Jovi, Metallica, Eminem, and Lincoln Park, and asked them if I can set up accounts for them. They agree, and I connect to all four of them. And then the next day, Lincoln Park connects back to me. So after that one day, I'm showing here an example of the connections that exist on this social media site. Uh, I'm showing a relation here because we have a set of ordered pairs. The domain, the first components, I would have to, because this is, uh, there are finitely many, I can list or roster and put the curly Q braces around. So there's me, I'm repeating a whole bunch of times, and then there's Lincoln Park, also showing up as having connected to someone back to me. Because of the repetition, it's not a function. The domain I've already given, the range would be Bon Jovi, Metallica, Eminem, Lincoln Park, and me, because those are all showing up as someone who's been connected to in the second component or second coordinate. This could, by the way, be put in a pictorial representation as follows. Oh, wait, I guess I am an amateur musician. Let me pause that. Here is the pictorial representation, and perhaps you can more clearly see what I'm talking about with domain and with range, and you can see that I am being connected to multiple other bands. So what would be an example of a relation that is a function? My go-to example is assigning grades at the end of a semester, putting in letter grades. And you could consider the class list of students as the domain, the grades they receive as the range. So individually, we have these elements, Carl, getting matched up with a C. So Carl is one of the X elements and C is one of the Y elements. But overall, the collection of all of those X's, that's the domain, and the collection of all of the Y's is the range. Each student has only been assigned one grade for that course. Because there are finitely many values, even though I'm not talking about numbers here, still X values and Y values, I use that set builder notation, if you're looking at braces around things, to write the domain range as a roster or a listing. So we've got Carl, Donita, Harold, and Juan as our domain and our range as A, B, C, and F. If I had written the relation as sets of ordered pairs, Carl with a C, Donita with an A, Harold with an F, and uh, Juan with a B. And we see no X value is repeating. And so not only is that a relation, but it's also a function. Each X is going to exactly one Y when we've written it this way, or even in the picture, we are not seeing repetition of an X going to multiple Y values. A relation can also be expressed in a table format. And just like I was able to go from the pictorial to the set of ordered pairs to write the relation, I could have gone the other direction as well. Same thing goes with this. I could have been given the set of ordered pairs and then come up with this table, vice versa. I see that 93 is being matched up with six. So I put parentheses 93 comma six comma 89 comma 11 for a second ordered pair and so on. And then when I'm done, put a set of curly Q braces around it. Okay, so we're asked what are the domain range on this and what is whether or not the relation is a function. So our domain would be the We've got finally many values, so I'm going to use the listing or roster method, 93, 
89, 82, 91, and 77. That set is the domain, and the range is 6, 11, 15, 3, and 17. Now, in that table, 93 only shows up once. It's only paired with 6. 89 only shows up once. It's only paired up with 11. And the same goes with the 82, 91, and the 77. These are all uh, being, each X is being paired with one Y. So we do have not only that it's a relation, but more specifically, it is a function. Quickly redoing a part because I could tell that uh, some uh, screen was not being shared. So here we have numbers as our values for X and Y. And when we have that, we can graph in two dimensions. And we are first asked, does this define a function? The answer <laughs> is yes. If it helps make it clear, I could write the three points that are plotted, negative three comma negative eight, it looks like. So negative three, negative eight, yes. And then zero one and eight one, we see no repetition of the X's. As for giving the domain and range, the domain is finite. So we only have to use the roster method to list it. There's our three X values and then our three Y values. Actually, we don't care if Y repeats. We care if X repeats by sending one X to different Y's. When we see repetition in the set, we don't list it. So we only have two distinctly different Y values. That's okay. If, however, I had a particular fourth point, in this case, right here, then it would change this to not being a function because we see the point 84 as well. And X is now going to two different values of Y, one and four. This doesn't change our domain, but it changes our range. And there's a particular way that we can tell that this is not a function when we look at this graphically. And specifically what that is, is that when we have two of the same X coordinate, we can connect those by a vertical line. This gives us something called a vertical line test or VLT for short. We would not have been able to do that for the original graph with the original three points. I mean, we can still do the vertical line test, but uh, in that case, it did not cross at more than one point. It could cross zero times or it could cross one time and we would have a function. But if we find a case where it is crossing more than once, some vertical line crossing more than once, it is not a function. If every vertical line does cross at most once, it is a function. Okay, so we've seen that a relation where each X is paired up with one Y, that's each X in the domain paired up with exactly one Y in the domain, that's a function. And we're about to take a look at where the rule of the relation is given as an equation. And we're going to find out what is the, uh, we're going to find out whether that equation is giving Y as a function of X. And second of all, to find out the domain, regardless of whether the relation is a function or not. Now, it would be a good idea to take a look at page 104, whether you have the paper textbook or the e-text, because when we have infinitely many values of X in the domain, we may need to write that instead of in the listing or rostering set notation, we may need to show that in something called interval notation. Notice the connection of interval notation to inequalities and the graphing of those inequalities. We're only talking about one variable here, X, the graphs of those inequalities on a number line. The reading, just like on a number line, the interval notation is read left to right, least to greatest, where you use a square bracket if the value is included in the solution, and you use a parenthesis if it's not included. And as we see down here, you will always have a parenthesis or parenthesis next to negative infinity or infinity, because those aren't numbers. Those aren't things that we can reach. Now, one thing about arithmetic that probably was not made clear when we were younger is that whenever you add two numbers, you get a unique answer. Add, subtract, multiply, divide, divide by something that's not zero, and you're gonna get a unique answer, like three plus four. We say that's seven today. We said it was seven weeks ago. We'll say it's seven tomorrow. Three plus four has a unique answer. Now, although this first example looks similar to this one, our answer to this one is no, it is not a function. And the reason for that is as follows. I 
I could have something plugged in for y, such as y equals one, one to the fourth power. That's one times one times one times one. That's going to give us that x is equal to one. But then if I put in negative one for y, because there are four copies of a negative, each pair is going to cancel out the negative. We get positive one for x there as well. And so we get the same value of x repeating, going to different values of y. So we don't have a function. And as for what is the domain, remember the domain is the set of x's. So you can put in anything you like for y. The range would be all real numbers. But because the exponent is even, any negatives, you're going to get cancellation of two pairs, negative and negative, negative and negative being multiplied together. Overall, we'll get something positive unless you put in zero itself, zero to the fourth power is zero. Otherwise, x is going to be positive. So the domain is x greater than or equal to zero. And when I translate that into integral notation, x greater than or equal to zero is going to look like that's for the next one. Just like I said, three plus four gives us a unique answer. Uh, and everything in arithmetic, as long as add, subtract, multiply, divide, as long as we're not dividing by zero. So whatever we put in for x, we can put in anything we like and multiply it by 14. And when we do so, we're going to get a unique answer. So this does have y as a function of x. And as for its domain, all real numbers, this is how we would express the domain, all real numbers in interval notation. There's no finite beginning or finite ending point where things would begin or end for what we put in for x. Same thing goes for this one. It's really a quite similar type of equation that we're seeing right here compared to this one. Um, if we first add six, we can put in anything we like for x and add six to that, and then divide by the non-zero number seven. So yes, it's a function of y is a function of x, and still the domain is all real numbers. What about when we cube things? You can take any number you like and multiply it by two more copies. So a total of three copies multiply together and get unique answers for y. And there's nothing stopping you for what you put in for x. You could take x to the third power for any of them. So yes, it's a function. Domains all real numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity uh, with parentheses around each of those. Now the next one, can we put in anything we like and subtract three? Yes. Do we get a unique answer? Yes. Um, we have to be a little bit careful, though, we're taking the square root. That is a principal or positive square root, so that's good. But we want to put in real numbers and get real number answers out. The answer to whether it is a function is yes. And as for the domain, we can only take the square roots of non-negative numbers. And to say that we're taking the square root of a non-negative number, well, here's what we're taking the square root of. Non-negative means it's greater than or equal to zero. So add three to both sides. That keeps that going in the same direction. X is greater than or equal to three. That is similar to the first one. So our domain in interval notation, because we had or equal to, we've got a square bracket by the three, and then we can put in anything larger. Can we take four and divide it by anything and get a unique answer and then change the sign? Well, actually we can refer to that this way and still be saying the same thing. As long as we don't divide by zero, then yes, we will get a unique answer. And as for the division by zero, we're just gonna leave that out of the domain, not because it doesn't give us a unique answer, it just can't be done. So we don't want X to be zero in that case. That is the same as saying it cannot be less. Sorry, that is the same as saying it could be anything either less than zero or greater than zero, just not zero itself. Now that word or, that's going to involve the union of two intervals. And there's a special symbol when we lump together or union two intervals. So here's our union symbol in the middle of those. So notice that what I'm doing, not only within a particular interval, am I going left to right, least to greatest, but also um, starting out with what would be left of zero and then what would be right of zero. We've got the parentheses there because zero itself could not be included. Back on the previous example, we had the square bracket because three minus three is zero and you can take the square root of zero. The square of zero is zero. Now, as for these last two, they're actually similar to the one we've just done. If I divide both sides by x, so that we get this, then it looks a lot like the previous question. As long as I leave out the things that I cannot divide by, 10 divided by any other non-zero number is going to give me a unique result. And so for each x, there is one y. That means y is a function of x. And so we come up with the same conclusion as with the previous question. The only difference here with the last example is that instead of dividing by x, you're dividing by x minus 10. 
this time that means that x minus 10 cannot be equal to zero because of what we're dividing by, all of x minus 10. That's going to result in x not equaling 10, which is the same as saying we can allow x to be less than 10 or allowing x to be greater than 10, just leave out 10 itself. And putting that into interval notation will be similar to when we left out exactly zero. Wherever I had zero in the interval in the last two examples, now I have 10. And yes, you could, for any other value of x, subtract 10 from it and then get a unique answer. Divide 7 by that and get another unique answer. So overall, y is a function of x because for each x, there is one y. Turning to something from earlier, we were talking about a vertical line test, which could also be abbreviated as VLT or VLT, not BLT, the vertical line test. So I was saying that if a vertical line does cross the graph of a relation more than once, then it's not a function. And if on the other hand, every vertical line is crossing no more than once, it can cross exactly once or even not cross at all, that's fine also. In that case, if that's true for all vertical lines, then you do have the graph of a function. You should show when there is a vertical line that crosses more than once, there's a whole bunch over here that don't even cross at all. There's this one right here that crosses only once, but here's an example of a vertical line that does cross in two places. So this is not a function, but we can still address what the domain and range are. Get that shown down here. The domain, because we are looking at x values that are less than or equal to, uh, looks like zero there that it's hitting the y-axis. Then we'd be going negative infinity. I'm not on my lab right now, so I don't have an infinity symbol to show, up to and including the zero. If they don't want the zero included, they would put a uh, open circle there. The range, because of those arrows, are saying that as we work our way from least to greatest, bottom to top in the y direction, that those arrows, it keeps on going down towards negative infinity and on up towards positive infinity. So our range, all real numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity. And I'll space to type that. Let me get rid of this so that you can see that a little more clearly. It's not a function and our domain and range. On the other hand, this graph, any vertical line I could think of drawing um, would never cross this more than once. So this is a function. The domain, although I'm not seeing the arrows, I'm pretty sure that they're meaning them to be there. And so it looks like we're still looking at uh, negative infinity to infinity, but this time it's in the x direction for the domain and our range as we work our way from bottom to top. There's no, again, even though I'm not seeing arrows, I think they're uh, meaning for this to keep on going downward. So working our way up from least to greatest, negative infinity. However, there is a finite stopping point at positive eight, and it looks like it's included. It's solid there, it's no open circle. So because of the inclusion, I'd have a square bracket. That's all I've got for now. Hope this helps. See you in class.